Welcome to today's Triple Z. The Triple Z Podcast is a daily program that you can use to help you fall asleep each night. Just turn down the volume, lay back, relax, and enjoy as you fall asleep. Heidi is a classic novel written by Swiss author Johanna Shapiri. It was originally published in 1881 in two parts, Heidi's Years of Learning and Travel, Heidi Slayer You and You Wander Jar, and Heidi Makes Use of What She Has Learned, Heidi Ken Brachen, was E.S. Jellern Hat. The story has since become one of the most well-loved and enduring children's books, captivating readers of all ages with its heartwarming narrative and picturesque portrayal of the Swiss Alps. The novel tells the story of Heidi, a young orphan girl who is sent to live with her reclusive grandfather in the Swiss Alps. Her grandfather, who is initially gruff and distant, gradually warms up to her and they form a deep bond. Heidi's innocence, kindness, and love for the mountains begin to transform the lives of those around her, including her grandfather and a young disabled girl named Clara, whom she befriends in Frankfurt. If you enjoy our program, please be sure to write us a review on your podcast platform and share us with a friend. You both might sleep just a little better at night. Our website is triple Z, that's three Z's dot media. You can also like and share our content on Facebook or our Instagram account ZZZ Media Podcast. Music for today's episode was provided by the Sleep Channel on Spotify. Chapter 3 Little Bear and Little Swan Heidi felt very happy next morning as she woke up in her new home and remembered all the many things that she had seen the day before and which she would see again that day, and above all she thought with delight of the deer goats. She jumped quickly out of bed and a very few minutes sufficed her to put on the clothes which she had taken off the night before, for there were not many of them. Then she climbed down the ladder and ran outside the hut. There stood Peter already with his flock of goats, and the grandfather was just bringing his two out of the shed to join the others. Heidi ran forward to wish good morning to him and the goats. Do you want to go with them onto the mountain? asked her grandfather. Nothing could have pleased Heidi better, and she jumped for joy in answer. The grandfather went inside the hut, calling to Peter to follow him and bring in his wallet. Peter obeyed with astonishment and laid down the little bag which held his meager dinner. Open it, said the old man, and he put in a large piece of bread and an equally large piece of cheese, which made Peter open his eyes, for each was twice the size of the two portions which he had for his own dinner. There, now there is only the little bowl to add, continued the grandfather, for the child cannot drink her milk as you do from the goat. She is not accustomed to that. You must milk two bowlfuls for her when she has her dinner, for she is going with you and will remain with you till you return this evening, but take care she does not fall over any of the rocks, do you hear? They started joyfully for the mountain. Heidi went running hither and thither and shouting with delight, for here were whole patches of delicate red primroses, and there the blue gleam of the lovely gentian, while above them all laughed and nodded the tender-leaved golden cystus. Enchanted with all this waving field of brightly colored flowers, Heidi forgot even Peter and the goats. She ran on in front and then off to the side, tempted first one way and then the other, as she caught sight of some bright spot glowing red or yellow. And all the while she was plucking whole handfuls of the flowers which she put into her little apron, for she wanted to take them all home and stick them in the hay, so that she might make her bedroom look just like the meadows outside. Peter had therefore to be on the alert, and his round eyes, which did not move very quickly, had more work than they could well manage, for the goats were as lively as Heidi, they ran in all directions, and Peter had to follow whistling and calling and swinging his stick to get all the runaways together again. 
Finally, they arrived at the spot where Peter generally halted for his goats to pasture and where he took up his quarters for the day. It lay at the foot of the high rocks, which were covered for some distance up by bushes and fir trees, beyond which rose their bare and rugged summits. On one side of the mountain, the rock was split into deep clefts, and the grandfather had reason to warn Peter of danger. Having climbed as far as the halting place, Peter unslung his wallet and put it carefully in a little hollow of the ground, for he knew what the wind was like up there and did not want to see his precious belongings sent rolling down the mountain by a sudden gust. Then he threw himself at full length on the warm ground and soon fell asleep. Heidi meanwhile had unfastened her apron and rolling it carefully round the flowers laid it beside Peter's wallet inside the hollow. She then sat down beside his outstretched figure and looked about her. The goats were climbing about among the bushes overhead. She had never felt so happy in her life before. She drank in the golden sunlight, the fresh air, the sweet smell of the flowers, and wished for nothing better than to remain there forever. Suddenly she heard a loud, harsh cry overhead and lifting her eyes she saw a bird, larger than any she had ever seen before, with great, spreading wings, wheeling round in wide circles, and uttering a piercing, croaking kind of sound above her. Peter, Peter, wake up, called out Heidi. See, the great bird is there, look, look, Peter got up on hearing her call, and together they sat and watched the bird, which rose higher and higher in the blue air till it disappeared behind the gray mountain tops. Where has it gone to? asked Heidi, who had followed the bird's movements with intense interest. Home to its nest, said Peter. Is his home right up there? Oh, how nice to be up so high. Why does he make that noise? Because he can't help it, explained Peter. Let us climb up there and see where his nest is, proposed Heidi. Oh, 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 exclaimed Peter, his disapproval of Heidi's suggestion becoming more marked with each ejaculation. Why, even the goats cannot climb as high as that. Besides, didn't Uncle say that you were not to fall over the rocks? Peter now began suddenly whistling and calling in such a loud manner that Heidi could not think what was happening, but the goats evidently understood his voice, for one after the other they came springing down the rocks until they were all assembled on the green plateau. Heidi jumped up and ran in and out among them, for it was new to her to see the goats playing together like this. Meanwhile, Peter had taken the wallet out of the hollow and placed the pieces of bread and cheese on the ground in the shape of a square, the larger two on Heidi's side and the smaller on his own, for he knew exactly which were hers and which his. Then he took the little bowl and milked some delicious, fresh milk into it from the white goat and afterwards set the bowl in the middle of the square. Leave off jumping about, it is time for dinner, said Peter, sit down now and begin. Heidi sat down. Is the milk for me? She asked. Yes, replied Peter, and the two large pieces of bread and cheese are yours also, and when you have drunk up that milk, you are to have another bowlful from the white goat, and then it will be my turn. And which do you get your milk from? inquired Heidi. From my own goat, the piebald one, but go on now with your dinner, said Peter, again reminding her it was time to eat. Heidi took up the bowl and drank her milk, and as soon as she had put it down empty Peter rose and filled it again for her. Then she broke off a piece of her bread and held out the remainder, which was still larger than Peter's own piece, together with the whole big slice of cheese to her companion, saying, you can have that, I have plenty. Peter looked at Heidi, unable to speak for astonishment. He hesitated a moment, for he could not believe that Heidi was in earnest, but the latter kept on holding out the bread and cheese, and as Peter still did not take it, she laid it down on his knees. 
He saw then that she really meant it. He seized the food, nodded his thanks and acceptance of her present, and then made a more splendid meal than he had known ever since he was a goat herd. Heidi the while still continued to watch the goats. Tell me all their names, she said. Peter knew these by heart, so he began telling Heidi the name of each goat in turn as he pointed it out to her. She listened with great attention, and it was not long before she could herself distinguish the goats from one another and could call each by name, for every goat had its own peculiarities which could not easily be mistaken. There was the great Turk with his big horns, who was always wanting to put the others, so that most of them ran away when they saw him coming and would have nothing to do with their rough companion. Only Greenfinch, the slender, nimble, little goat, was brave enough to face him and would make a rush at him three or four times in succession. Then there was little white snowflake who bleated in such a plaintive and beseeching manner that Heidi already had several times run to it and taken its head in her hands to comfort it. Just at this moment the pleading young cry was heard again and Heidi jumped up running and putting her arms around the little creature's neck asked in a sympathetic voice, what is it, little snowflake? Why do you call like that as if in trouble? The goat pressed closer to Heidi in a confiding way and left off bleeding. Peter called out from where he was sitting for he had not yet got to the end of his bread and cheese dash. She cries like that because the old goat is not with her. She was sold that man fell the day before yesterday and so will not come up the mountain anymore. Who is the old goat? called Heidi back. Why, her mother, of course, was the answer. Where is the grandmother? called Heidi again. She has none. And the grandfather? She has none. Oh, you poor little snowflake, exclaimed Heidi, clasping the animal gently to her, but do not cry like that anymore, see now. I shall come up here with you every day, so that you will not be alone anymore, and if you want anything you have only to come to me. The goats were now beginning to climb the rocks again, each seeking for the plants it liked in its own fashion, some jumping over everything they met till they found what they wanted, others going more carefully and cropping all the nice leaves by the way, the Turk still now and then giving the others a poke with his horns. Little swan and little bear clambered lightly up and never failed to find the best bushes, and then they would stand gracefully poised on their pretty legs, delicately nibbling at the leaves. Heidi stood with her hands behind her back, carefully noting all they did. Peter, she said to the boy who had again thrown himself down on the ground, the prettiest of all the goats are little swan and little bear. Yes, I know they are was the answer. All Uncle brushes them down and washes them and gives them salt and he has the nicest shed for them. All of a sudden Peter leaped to his feet and ran hastily after the goats. Heidi followed him as fast as she could for she was too eager to know what had happened to stay behind. Peter dashed through the middle of the flock towards that side of the mountain where the rocks fell perpendicularly to a great depth below, and where any thoughtless goat, if it went too near, might fall over it and break all its legs. He had caught sight of the inquisitive greenfinch taking leaps in that direction, and he was only just in time, for the animal had already sprung to the edge of the abyss. All Peter could do was to throw himself down and seize one of her hind legs. Greenfinch, thus taken by surprise, began bleeding furiously, angry at being held so fast and prevented from continuing her voyage of discovery. She struggled to get loose and endeavored so obstinately to leap forward that Peter shouted to Heidi to come and help him, for he could not get up and was afraid of pulling out the goat's leg altogether. Heidi had already run up and she saw at once the danger both Peter and the animal were in. She quickly gathered a bunch of sweet smelling leaves and then, holding them under Greenfinch's nose, said coaxingly, come, come, Greenfinch, 
you must not be naughty. Look, you might fall down there and break your leg and that would give you dreadful pain. The young animal turned quickly and began contentedly eating the leaves out of Heidi's hand. Meanwhile, Peter got onto his feet again and took hold of Greenfinch by the band round her neck from which her belt was hung and Heidi taking hold of her in the same way on the other side, they led the wanderer back to the rest of the flock that had remained peacefully feeding. Peter, now he had his goat in safety, lifted his stick in order to give her a good beating as punishment and Greenfinch seeing what was coming shrank back in fear. But Heidi cried out, no, no, Peter, you must not strike her, see how frightened she is. She deserves it, growled Peter and again lifted his stick. Then Heidi flung herself against him and cried indignantly, you have no right to touch her, it will hurt her, let her alone. Peter looked with surprise at the commanding little figure whose dark eyes were flashing and reluctantly he let his stick drop. Well, I will let her off if you will give me some more of your cheese tomorrow, he said, for he was determined to have something to make up to him for his fright. You shall have it all, tomorrow and every day, I do not want it, replied Heidi, giving ready consent to his demand. And I will give you bread as well, a large piece like you had today, but then you must promise never to beat Greenfinch, or Snowflake, or any of the goats. All right, said Peter, I don't care, which meant that he would agree to the bargain and let go of Greenfinch, who joyfully sprang to join her companions. And thus imperceptibly the day had crept onto its close, and now the sun was on the point of sinking out of sight behind the high mountains. Heidi was again sitting on the ground, when all at once she sprang to her feet, Peter, Peter, Everything is on fire. All the rocks are burning and the great snow mountain and the sky. Oh, look, look. The high rock up there is red with flame. Oh, the beautiful fiery snow. Stand up, Peter. See, the fire has reached the great bird's nest. Look at the rocks. Look at the fir trees. Everything, everything is on fire. It is always like that, said Peter composedly, continuing to peel his stick, but it is not really fire. What is it then? cried Heidi. It gets like that of itself, explained Peter. Look, look, cried Heidi in fresh excitement. Now they have turned all rose color. Look at that one covered with snow and now with the high, pointed rocks. What do you call them? Mountains have not any names, he answered. Oh, how beautiful, look at the crimson snow. And up there on the rocks, there are ever so many roses. Oh, now they are turning gray. Oh, oh, now all the color has died away. It's all gone, Peter. And Heidi sat down on the ground looking as full of distress as if everything had really come to an end. It will come again tomorrow, said Peter. Get up, we must go home now. He whistled to his goats and together they all started on their homeward way. Is it like that every day? Shall we see it every day when we bring the goats up here? Asked Heidi. As she clambered down the mountain at Peter's side, she waited eagerly for his answer, hoping that he would tell her it was so. It is like that most days, he replied. But will it be like that tomorrow for certain? Heidi persisted. Yes, yes, tomorrow for certain, Peter assured her in answer. Heidi now felt quite happy again and her little brain was so full of new impressions and new thoughts that she did not speak any more until they had reached the hut. The grandfather was sitting under the fir trees where he had put up a new seat. Heidi ran up to him, followed by the white and brown goats, for they knew their own master and stall. 
Peter called out after her, come with me again tomorrow. Good night. For he was anxious for more than one reason that Heidi should go with him the next day. Oh, grandfather, cried Heidi, it was so beautiful. The fire and the roses on the rocks and the blue and yellow flowers and look what I have brought you. And opening the apron that held her flowers, she shook them all out at her grandfather's feet. But the poor flowers, how changed they were. Heidi hardly knew them again. They looked like dry bits of hay, not a single little flower cup stood open. Oh, grandfather, what is the matter with them? exclaimed Heidi in shocked surprise. They were not like that this morning. Why do they look so now? They like to stand out there in the sun and not to be shut up in an apron, said her grandfather. Then I will never gather any more. But, grandfather, why did the great bird go on croaking so? She continued in an eager tone of inquiry. Go along now and get into your bath while I go and get some milk. When we are together at supper, I will tell you all about it. Heidi obeyed and when later she was sitting on her high stool before her milk bowl with her grandfather beside her, she repeated her question, why does the great bird go on croaking and screaming down at us, grandfather? He is mocking at the people who live down below in the villages because they all go huddling and gossiping together and encourage one another in evil talking and deeds. He calls out, if you would separate and each go your own way and come up here and live on a height as I do, it would be better for you. There was almost a wildness in the old man's voice as he spoke, so that Heidi seemed to hear the croaking of the bird again even more distinctly. Why haven't the mountains any names? Heidi went on. They have names, answered her grandfather, and if you can describe one of them to me then I know I will tell you what it is called. Heidi then described to him the rocky mountain with the two high peaks so exactly that the grandfather was delighted. Just so, I know it, and he told her its name. Then Heidi told him of the mountain with the great snowfield and how it had been on fire. The grandfather explained to her it was the sun that did it. When he says good night to the mountains, he throws his most beautiful colors over them so that they may not forget him before he comes again the next day. Heidi was delighted with this explanation and could hardly bear to wait for another day to come that she might once more climb up with the goats and see how the sun bid good night to the mountains. But she had to go to bed first and all night she slept soundly on her bed of hay dreaming of nothing but of shining mountains with red roses all over them, among which happy little snowflake went leaping in and out. Chapter 4 Shooting Down the Mountain Side The next morning the sun came out early as bright as ever, and then Peter appeared with the goats, and again the two children climbed up together to the high meadows, and so it went on day after day till Heidi, passing her life thus among the grass and flowers, was burnt brown with the sun and grew so strong and healthy that nothing ever ailed her. She was happy too and lived from day to day as free and lighthearted as the little birds that make their home among the green forest trees. Then the autumn came and the wind blew louder and stronger and the grandfather would say sometimes, today you must stay at home, Heidi. A sudden gust of the wind would blow a little thing like you over the rocks into the valley below in a moment. Whenever Peter heard that he must go alone, he looked very unhappy, for he saw nothing but mishaps of all kinds ahead and did not know how he should bear the long, dull day without Heidi. Then, too, there was the good meal he would miss, and besides that the goats on these days were so naughty and obstinate that he had twice the usual trouble with them, for they had grown so accustomed to Heidi's presence that they would run in every direction and refuse to go on unless she was with them. Heidi was never unhappy, for wherever she was she found something to interest or amuse her. She liked best, it is true, to go out with Peter up to the flowers and the great bird, 
but she also found her grandfather's hammering and sawing and carpentering very entertaining, and if it should chance to be the day when the large, round goat's milk cheese was made, she enjoyed beyond measure watching her grandfather stir the great cauldron. The thing which attracted her most, however, was the waving and roaring of the three old fir trees on these windy days. She would stand underneath them and look up, unable to tear herself away, looking and listening while they bowed and swayed and roared as the mighty wind rushed through them. There was no longer now the warm, bright sun that had shone all through the summer, so Heidi went to the cupboard and got her shoes and stockings and dress. Then it grew very cold, and Peter would come up early in the morning blowing on his fingers to keep them warm. But he soon left off coming, for one night there was a heavy fall of snow, and the next morning the whole mountain was covered with it, and not a single little green leaf even was to be seen anywhere upon it. There was no Peter that day, and Heidi stood at the little window looking out in wonderment, for the snow was beginning again, and the thick flakes kept falling till the snow was up to the window, and still they continued to fall, and the snow grew higher so that at last the window could not be opened, and she and her grandfather were shut up fast within the hut. Heidi thought this was great fun and ran from one window to the other. The next day, the snow having ceased, the grandfather went out and shoveled it away from the house and threw it into such great heaps that they looked like mountains. Heidi and her grandfather were sitting one afternoon on their three-legged stools before the fire when there came a great thump at the door. It was Peter all white with snow for he had had to fight his way through deep snowdrifts. He had been determined, however, to climb up to the hut for it was a week now since he had seen Heidi. Good evening, he said as he came in. Then he went and placed himself as near the fire as he could, his whole face beaming with pleasure at finding himself there. Heidi looked on in astonishment, for Peter was beginning to thaw all over with the warmth so that he had the appearance of a trickling waterfall. Well, General, how goes it with you, said the grandfather, now that you have lost your army you will have to turn to your pen and pencil. Why must he turn to his pen and pencil? asked Heidi immediately, full of curiosity. During the winter he must go to school, explained her grandfather, and learn how to read and write. It's a bit hard, although useful sometimes afterwards. Am I not right, General? Yes, indeed, assented Peter. Heidi's interest was now thoroughly awakened and she had so many questions to ask Peter about school, and the conversation took so long that he had time to get thoroughly dry. Well, now, General, you have been under fire for some time and must want some refreshment. Come and join us, said the grandfather as he brought the supper out of the cupboard, and Heidi pushed the stools to the table. There was also now a bench fastened against the wall, for as he was no longer alone the grandfather had put up seats of various kinds here and there, long enough to hold two persons, for Heidi had a way of always keeping close to her grandfather whether he was walking, sitting, or standing. Peter opened his round eyes very wide when he saw what a large piece of meat on uncle gave him on his thick slice of bread. It was a long time since Peter had had anything so nice to eat. As soon as the pleasant meal was over he began to get ready for returning home for it was already growing dark. He had said his good night and his thanks and was just going out when he turned and said, I shall come again next Sunday, this day week, and my grandmother sent word that she would like you to come and see her some day. It was quite a new idea to Heidi that she should go and pay anybody a visit, and she could not get it out of her head, so the first thing she said to her grandfather the next day was, I must go down to see the grandmother today, she will be expecting me. The snow is too deep, answered the grandfather, trying to put her off. Not a day passed, but what she said five or six times to her grandfather, I must certainly go today, the grandmother will be waiting for me. 
On the fourth day, when Heidi was sitting on her high stool at dinner with the bright sun shining in upon her through the window, she again repeated her little speech, I must certainly go down to see the grandmother today, or else I shall keep her waiting too long. The grandfather rose from the table, climbed up to the hayloft and brought down the thick sack that was Heidi's coverlet and said, come along then. The child skipped out gleefully after him into the glittering world of snow. The old fir trees were standing now quite silent, their branches covered with the white snow, and they looked so lovely as they glittered and sparkled in the sunlight that Heidi jumped for joy at the sight and kept on calling out, come here, come here, grandfather. The fir trees are all silver and gold. The grandfather had gone into the shed and he now came out, dragging a large hand sleigh. Inside there was a low seat, and the sleigh could be pushed forward and guided by the feet of the one who sat upon it with the help of a pole that was fastened to the side. The old man got in and lifted the child onto his lap, then he wrapped her up in the sack that she might keep nice and warm and put his left arm closely round her for it was necessary to hold her tight during the coming journey. He now grasped the pole with his right hand and gave the sleigh a push forward with his two feet. It shot down the mountainside with such rapidity that Heidi thought they were flying through the air like a bird and shouted aloud with delight. Suddenly they came to a standstill and there they were at Peter's hut. Her grandfather lifted her out and unwrapped her. There you are, now go in, and when it begins to grow dark you must start on your way home again. Then he left her and went up the mountain, pulling his sleigh after him. Heidi opened the door of the hut and stepped into a tiny room that looked very dark, with a fireplace and a few dishes on a wooden shelf, this was the little kitchen. She opened another door and found herself in another small room, for the place was not a herdsman's hut like her grandfather's, with one large room on the ground floor and a hayloft above, but a very old cottage where everything was narrow and poor and shabby. A table was close to the door, and as Heidi stepped in she saw a woman sitting at it, putting a patch on a waistcoat which Heidi recognized at once as Peter's. In the corner sat an old woman, bent with age, spinning. Heidi was quite sure this was the grandmother, so she went up to the spinning wheel and said, Good day, grandmother, I have come at last. Did you think I was a long time coming? The old woman raised her head and felt for the hand that the child held out to her, and when she had found it, she passed her own over it thoughtfully for a few seconds, and then said, are you the child who lives up with Aunt Uncle? Are you Heidi? Yes, yes, answered Heidi. I have just come down in the sleigh with Grandfather. Is it possible? Why, your hands are quite warm. Brigitta, did Aunt Uncle come himself with the child? Peter's mother had left her work and risen from the table and now stood looking at Heidi with curiosity, scanning her from head to foot. I do not know, mother, whether uncle came himself. It is hardly likely. The child probably makes a mistake. But Heidi looked steadily at the woman and said, I know quite well who wrapped me up in my bed cover and brought me down in the sleigh. It was grandfather. There was some truth then perhaps in what Peter used to tell us of Aunt Uncle during the summer when we thought he must be wrong, said Grandmother, but who would ever have believed that such a thing was possible? I did not think the child would live three weeks up there. What is she like, Brigitta? The latter had so thoroughly examined Heidi on all sides that she was well able to describe her to her mother. Heidi meanwhile had not been idle. She had made the round of the room and looked carefully at everything there was to be seen. All of a sudden she exclaimed, Grandmother, one of your shutters is flapping backwards and forwards. Grandfather would put a nail in and make it all right in a minute. It will break one of the panes someday. Look how it keeps on banging. Ah, dear child, said the old woman. 
I am not able to see it, but I can hear that and many other things besides the shutter. Everything about the place rattles and creaks when the wind is blowing and it gets inside through all the cracks and holes. The house is going to pieces and in the night, when the two others are asleep, I often lie awake in fear and trembling, thinking that the whole place will give way and fall and kill us. And there is not a creature to mend anything for us, for Peter does not understand such work. But why cannot you see, grandmother, that the shutter is loose? Look, there it goes again, see, that one there. And Heidi pointed to the particular shutter. Alas, child, I can see nothing, nothing, said the grandmother in a voice of lamentation. But if I were to go outside and put back the shutter so that you had more light, then you could see, grandmother? No, no, not even then, no one can make it light for me again. But if you were to go outside among all the white snow, then surely you would find it light. Just come with me, grandmother, and I will show you. Heidi took hold of the old woman's hand to lead her along, for she was beginning to feel quite distressed at the thought of her being without light. Let me be, dear child, it is always dark for me now, whether in snow or sun. It will never be light for me again on earth, never. At these words Heidi broke into loud crying. In her distress she kept on sobbing out, who can make it light for you again? Can no one do it? Isn't there anyone who can do it? The grandmother now tried to comfort the child, but it was not easy to quiet her. Heidi did not often weep, but when she did she could not get over her trouble for a long while. At last the old woman said, Dear Heidi, you cannot think how glad I am to hear a kind word when I can no longer see, and it is such a pleasure to me to listen to you while you talk. So come and sit beside me and tell me what you do up there and how grandfather occupies himself. I knew him very well in the old days, but for many years now I have heard nothing of him except through Peter, who never says much. This was a new and happy idea to Heidi. She quickly dried her tears and said in a comforting voice, Wait, grandmother, till I have told grandfather everything, he will make it light for you again, I am sure, and will do something so that the house will not fall, he will put everything right for you. Heidi now began to give a lively description of her life with the grandfather and of the days she spent on the mountain with the goats, and then went on to tell what she did during the winter and how her grandfather was able to make all sorts of things, seats and stools, and mangers where the hay was put for little swan and little bear, besides a new large water tub for her to bathe in when the summer came, and a new milk bowl and spoon. The grandmother listened with the greatest attention, only from time to time addressing her daughter. Do you hear that, Brigitta? Do you hear what she is saying about uncle? The conversation was suddenly interrupted by a heavy thump on the door, and in marched Peter, who stood stock still, opening his eyes with astonishment when he caught sight of Heidi, then his face beamed with smiles as she called out, Good evening, Peter. What, is the boy back from school already? exclaimed the grandmother in surprise. I have not known an afternoon to pass so quickly as this one for years. How is the reading getting on, Peter? As usual, was Peter's answer. The old woman gave a little sigh. Ah, well, she said, I hoped you would have something different to tell me by this time, as you are going to be 12 years old this February. What was it you hoped he would have to tell you? Asked Heidi, interested in all the grandmother said. I mean that he ought to have learned to read a bit by now continued the grandmother. Up there on the shelf is an old prayer book with beautiful songs in it which I have not heard for a long time and cannot now remember to repeat to myself, and I hoped that Peter would soon learn enough to be able to read one of them to me sometimes, but he finds it too difficult. 
Heidi now jumped up from her low chair and holding out her hand hastily to the grandmother said, Good night, grandmother, it is getting dark, I must go home at once, and bidding goodbye to Peter and his mother she went towards the door. But the grandmother called out in an anxious voice, Wait, wait, Heidi, you must not go along like that, Peter must go with you. Have you got something warm to put round your throat? I have not anything to put on, called back Heidi, but I am sure I shall not be cold, and with that she ran outside and went off at such a pace that Peter had difficulty in overtaking her. The children had taken but a few steps before they saw the grandfather coming down to meet them, and in another minute his long strides had brought him to their side. That's right, Heidi, you have kept your word, said the grandfather, and then wrapping the sack firmly round her he lifted her in his arms and strode off with her up the mountain. They had no sooner got inside the hut than Heidi at once began, Grandfather, tomorrow we must take the hammer and the long nails and fasten Grandmother's shutter and drive in a lot more nails in other places, for her house shakes and rattles all over. We must, must we? Who told you that? asked her grandfather. Nobody told me, but I know it for all that, replied Heidi, for everything is giving way, and when the grandmother cannot sleep, she lies trembling, for she thinks that every minute the house will fall down on their heads, and everything now is dark for grandmother, and she does not think anyone can make it light for her again, but you will be able to, I am sure, grandfather. Tomorrow we must go and help her, we will, won't we? Grandfather? The child was clinging to the old man and looking up at him in trustful confidence. The grandfather looked down at Heidi for a while without speaking and then said, Yes, Heidi, we will do something to stop the rattling. At least we can do that. We will go down about it tomorrow. The child went skipping round the room for joy, crying out, We shall go tomorrow. We shall go tomorrow. The grandfather kept his promise. On the following afternoon he brought the sleigh out again, and as on the previous day, he set Heidi down at the door of the grandmother's hut and said, Go in now, and when it grows dark, come out again. Then he put the sack in the sleigh and went round the house. Heidi had hardly opened the door and sprung into the room when the grandmother called out from her corner, It's the child again. Here she comes. Heidi ran to her and then quickly drew the little stool close up to the old woman and seating herself upon it, began to tell and ask her all kinds of things. All at once came the sound of heavy blows against the wall of the hut and grandmother gave such a start of alarm that she nearly upset the spinning wheel and cried in a trembling voice, Ah, my God, now it is coming, the house is going to fall upon us. But Heidi caught her by the arm and said soothingly, No, no, grandmother, do not be frightened. It is only grandfather with his hammer. He is mending up everything so that you shan't have such fear and trouble. Is it possible? Is it really possible? So the dear God has not forgotten us, exclaimed the grandmother. Do you hear, Brigitta, what that noise is? Did you hear what the child says? Go outside, Brigitta, and if it is all uncle, tell him he must come inside a moment that I may thank him. Brigitta went outside and found all uncle in the act of fastening some heavy pieces of new wood along the wall. She stepped up to him and said, Good evening, uncle, mother, and I thank you for doing us such a kind service, and she would like to tell you herself how grateful she is. I do not know who else would have done it for us. We shall not forget your kindness, for I am sure Dash. That will do, said the old man, interrupting her. I know what you think of all uncle without your telling me. Go indoors again. I can find out for myself where the mending is wanted. Brigitte obeyed on the spot, for uncle had a way with him that made few people care to oppose his will. 
He went on knocking with his hammer all round the house and then mounted the narrow steps to the roof and hammered away there until he had used up all the nails he had brought with him. Meanwhile it had been growing dark and he had hardly come down from the roof and dragged the sleigh out from behind the goat shed when Heidi appeared outside. The grandfather wrapped her up and took her in his arms as he had done the day before, for although he had to drag the sleigh up the mountain after him, he feared that if the child sat in it alone her wrappings would fall off and that she would be nearly if not quite frozen, so he carried her warm and safe in his arms. So the winter went by. After many years of joyless life, the blind grandmother had at last found something to make her happy. She listened for the little tripping footstep as soon as day had come, and when she heard the door open and knew the child was really there, she would call out, God be thanked, she has come again. And Heidi had also grown very fond of the old grandmother, and when at last she knew for certain that no one could make it life for her again, she was overcome with sorrow. But the grandmother told her again that she felt the darkness much less when Heidi was with her, and so every fine winter's day the child came traveling down in her sleigh. The grandfather always took her, never raising any objection, indeed he always carried the hammer and sundry other things down in the sleigh with him, and many an afternoon was spent by him in making the goat herd's cottage sound and tight. It no longer groaned and rattled the whole night through, and the grandmother, who for many winters had not been able to sleep in peace as she did now, said she should never forget what the uncle had done for her.